Mike, Mike check. Hello, everybody. Welcome to Hot Science Cool Talks. Are you as excited as I am to be here? Yeah. <laughs> Excellent. Excellent. So tonight, I would like to thank all of the great people who put on all those exciting hands-on things outside, our Community Science Fair stars from the Children's Research Lab at UT, Department of Communication Sciences at UT, Fun with Chemistry, the Lang Stuttering Institute, School of Nursing and Scientists in Residence. These are all of our UT Science Fair stars. And also people from the community, from outside of UT, from Austin Community College, Pflugerville ISD, make, create those cool circuit things. I couldn't solve that one. National Kidney Foundation, Seton, and the Texas Department of State Health Services. Let's thank all of these people for all the great stuff they gave us. We have uh, some school groups here tonight. Let's hear a shout out for Anderson High School. <laughs> I think I know where they are. The Austin Area Homeschool Science Team. <laughs> and Mendez Middle School. <laughs> Murkison Middle School. <laughs> All right. UT Lions Club volunteers. Special thanks also to Encore for providing support to help us put on Hot Science School Talks. Also to Earth Day Texas for providing also support for Hot Science School Talks as well as HEB. And all of these great organizations and uh, many other great folks we, who we count among the generous supporters and our advisory council who all help make these things happen. And last but not least, uh, Dell Medical School, Jackson School of Geosciences, and UT School of Nursing all helped make tonight happen. So please remember to uh, silence your mobile devices. There's no conversations during the talk. There'll be plenty of time for talk during our Q&A, which will follow immediately after the talk. And for those watching on the webcast, let's, uh, let's say hi. We give a shout out to everyone watching on the webcast. There's a lot of different things. Let's just try one big howdy. One, two, three. Howdy! Ah, I think they're going to like that one. <laughs> so if you're watching on the webcast, please send your questions into outreach at esi.utexas.edu anytime throughout the talk, starting now. So we have our 104th Hot Science Cool Talk tonight. It's uh, never wait for a doctor again, revolutionizing healthcare. And uh, the Dell Medical School it's pretty exciting. It's actually up and running. That is a really cool thing. It's the first medical school in 50 years that's been built from the ground up at a major university. That's pretty remarkable. But in addition to that, it also has a very bold mission to come up with and innovate new ways to train doctors, to come up and innovate with new ways to reach out to the community, and to come up with and innovate new ways to provide health care. So that's a really bold vision. And when the University of Texas set about searching for the person to oversee this operation, it was pretty clear that what was needed was someone who was a practicing physician, someone who was an award-winning medical researcher, someone who was an award-winning teacher, and not only all of that, but someone who would have the vision to be able to take this new enterprise of the Dell Medical School boldly to places where no other medical school had gone before. And that person, as it turns out, is Clay Johnson. Please help me in welcoming Clay. Thank you. Thank you. So thank you. It's great, uh, it's great to be here. I don't think I've ever stood in front of uh, a group to give a talk where there was such a range of age. Um, it is, a, you know, just looking out there and just thinking about, gosh, how do you, how do you make something interesting to the youngest in the audience and to the oldest in the audience? But I think the one thing about health and healthcare is that it is something that affects us all. And even at a very early age, we have encounters with our doctors and with the healthcare system that are really memorable and important to us. And then as we get older and older, we become more and more dependent on the healthcare system. And uh, we see how it impacts our families and friends, and so it becomes important to us as well. So I'm going to talk about that. I'm going to talk about the system. I'm going to um, focus initially about on the current system and maybe some of the problems with it. 
Um, then I'm going to move to, um, well, what are some exciting things going on? And where, where is the, the science and the technology uh, taking us? Uh, and then I'm going to talk about how we need you all to be more involved. So um, Moore's Law. So how many of you know what Moore's Law is? Okay, the older folks. So Moore's <laughs> Law, Moore's Law is this thing that, that says that computers are getting faster and faster and cheaper and cheaper. So we can process a lot more data um, now than we could even a year ago or, or two years ago. And this, this thing, Moore's Law, it's this exponential increase in the speed and exponential decrease in the cost of computing. And that's really driven this transformation in technology. And we see it in everything, right? So, you know, one is that the Apollo mission, the computers that ran the Apollo mission were less, far less powerful than the computer that, that many of us carry in our, in our pocket. Um, and yet, that computer cost over a billion dollars, and well, this one's still too expensive, but it's a whole lot cheaper than that. <laughs> so this is Moore's Law, and it's made the, the world kind of look like this, right? So this is sort of my map of the world. Everything nicely connected and you know, built on technologies. And think about, about how we communicate. Um, think about the way media works, the banking, all of those things built on this framework of technology. Um, when was the last time you wrote a letter? You know, the, um, for the young people, you may not write letters at all, you know, and um, all of that now done electronically. Um, but if this is the world and how technology has trans transformed the world, then this is the healthcare system. <laughs> so it's still built on this antiquated technology where the best thing we can talk about is the electronic health record, so, which is this horrible thing that never should have been introduced into the healthcare system at all. The, the largest source of dissatisfaction amongst physicians today, um, built on like the, the stuff that um, uh, those of us with gray hair were using in college, that kind of level of software, that's what electronic health record looks like. Um, and even things like email we can't do in the electronic in, in the uh, healthcare system. And we're 20% of the economy. You know, if you look at all industries, healthcare is about 20%. So th it's not just technology. That's emblematic of what's going on in the healthcare system itself, a system that's really broken. The costs of healthcare have gone up dramatically. They continue to go up. Last year, 5%. We cheered for 5%. Well, of course, that's three times background inflation. No, it's a huge increase. You, you, we just can't, can't pay for this anymore. And if you look at the changes that we've had in our quality of life and life expectancy, they have been fairly modest. So rapid increases, not that much return. So in fact, a huge investment, particularly in the U.S., very little return. The U.S. is by far the number one spender in healthcare. So if you look at it on a per capita basis, we're about 30% more expensive than the next most expensive country. That's Switzerland. Everything is expensive in Switzerland. So to be more expensive than Switzerland is a really sad state of affairs. Um, but when you look at health outcomes, so this is the World Health Organization's ranking for, of countries by outcomes, we're 34th. That's on a broad array of, of health metrics. And that puts us between Costa Rica and Cuba. Those are our closest countries. And in fact, the, the lifespan in Cuba is slightly longer than it is in the US. Um, and Cuba, so we spend about $9,000 per person on average for health care. In Cuba, they spend $800 on average per person. And they live as long as we do. And that's with all that tequila, and uh, rum and cigars and all of that stuff, they, they still are, are uh, doing just as well as we are. So a pretty big disconnect in, in what they receive from their healthcare system and what we receive. So these are just some examples to remind us all of where we are today and to also demonstrate maybe that these are solvable problems. So I showed you this already. I'm, these, I'm counting up, you know, the, the old David Letterman thing, so working up the, up the numbers. So number 10, the cost of care out of control and only going up, so I've shown, shown you that. Um, 
Number nine, no one pays for prevention. So our healthcare system spends a ton of money on emergency rooms, surgeries, when, when we're really ill, spends a ton of money. But for things that keep us healthy, no. Doesn't spend, ignores those things. So encouraging us to eat better or to exercise or you know, gym memberships, any of that stuff, no. You know, can't even imagine having that pay for. And yet if we paid more for prevention, not only would we be healthier, you could actually reduce the cost in the entire system by preventing these things that are so expensive downstream, and yet we don't, we don't do that. It's nearly impossible to find a doctor. So um, I now have been here for almost three years, but um, when we arrived, I had to find a pediatrician for my boys. And it was really hard. You know, you, you ask around, you try to find, is there any resource online that's useful? No. You ask around, and um, eventually you find some names, you call, they're not taking new patients, they don't like your insurance. Um, it was really hard, and I'm the dean of the med school. <laughs> so what's it like for, for somebody who's not used to navigating the system and doesn't have connections? It's extremely difficult, whereas if I wanted to find an appointment at a nice restaurant tomorrow at 7 o'clock for Ethiopian food, and I wanted to make sure it was high quality, it'd be great to know that about docs, right? I could just go to my phone, and open table is right here for me, and immediately get that information. It's pretty amazing that you, you know, which is more important, you know, finding a good doctor and knowing, you know, that you can go in to see them, or or finding a good restaurant. I mean, I, I guess the consumer product line tells us. Um, number seven, no one reminds you to take your meds. So the number one reason that medications don't work is that people don't take them. Number one reason. And in fact, half of people are not taking their medications as directed three months after they're prescribed. Half of people. So here we spend all this money trying to develop new drugs, and yet we don't even have a simple reminder system, apps, checks of whether you filled your scripts, any of that stuff, to even see whether and remind, help people to take the meds that are, are prescribed, right? Amazing, what's that about? That's such a bizarre disconnect. Um, office visits are way too short. So average office visits today are 12 minutes. Um, and that, what can happen in 12 minutes? I mean, we've all been on the other side of that 12 minutes, right? Well, on the doctor side, so I'm a neurologist. On the doctor side of it, 12 minutes is not enough. We want more time too. You want time to connect with your patients. You know they got a lot of questions. You, you want to also hear about their cat. <laughs> and and you, don't, you cannot even get one question addressed from a patient in a 12 minute visit. And yet we've allowed our system to shrink these visits and to make them so short that for kids, it's all about the, oh, how's he doing? Any fever recently? No, Shh. okay, you're out of here, and then it's the next one. I mean, it's a meaningless, it's a meaningless encounter. Um, flu management requires an office visit. So if you got the flu, you're feeling terrible, you're at home, you, you, you know, you first you gotta call up, find somebody who's willing to see you, right? Or you know, you, your doc probably can't, it's probably you know, weeks out. You stuck with one of those urgent care places where your copays are incredible in those. So that, you know, that you stuck going there. You drive down, you probably wait 40 minutes. 40 minutes is the average wait now in a doctor's office, 40 minutes. And then in the meantime, you're coughing, touching everything, getting everybody else sick around you, right? You go to see the doc, you got 12 minutes. And what are they going to tell you? Well, fluids and some Tylenol. Then you're going to get back in your car, drive home, take your Tylenol, go to bed, and wish you'd never done it, right? There's, you knew you had the flu. The doc could figure that out too and tell you what needed to happen, or if there was something worrisome, figure it out just by a video visit, right, on your phone. They could just take a look, you know, look at your throat, look at you, talk to you, and figure out what was necessary. That whole thing could have been avoided by just allowing technologies that work beautifully, like Skype, to be a part of that encounter. And yet we don't, we don't make that a part of the way um, we, uh, we, we run the healthcare system. 
Number four, you can't find an apple on a vending machine. Um, so this one kills me. I, uh, you know, I had my boys come visit at the, um, in the office. You know, you're working on the weekend. You can't, nothing else for them to do. So they come down to the office. And they get hungry, and so they go down to the vending machine. And, you know, what are the choices? They get, you know, these 20-ounce sugar-filled sodas and uh, chips and, you know, candy bars. And it, it, you just, it's, healthy choices should be there, right? You don't have to choose the healthy thing, but at least the choices should be there. Um, and yet we somehow can't, can't figure this out. You know, that we don't have those choices. They're not the ones that are most convenient. Number three, if you're going to the doctor's office, you're seeing a lot more of the back of your doctor's head. So this is about the electronic health record again. So now, because docs spend a lot more time, at least twice as much time documenting on electronic health records than they do in front of patients, they're spending all this time looking this way and, and just sort of, oh, really? Yeah. You know, oh, I see. You know, that kind of encounter where docs hate it and patients hate it too. Again, a horrible, horrible system. Number two, you can't email your doc. Email is hardly a technology, right? It's ubiquitous. Every, every industry uses it. And yet, in, in, to email your doc is an incredible barrier, really hard. And then number one, hospital gowns expose your rear. <laughs> so this one, so I know it's the, it's the funny one, yeah, but this one um, is particularly interesting. So um, I took my, my son, my son had a, some urologic problems, and um, so he had to, had to go into the doctor's office to get examined. They handed him the gown to wear, and he's like, I'm not wearing that. You totally refuse to get that thing on, and who could blame him? You know, that thing is like totally dehumanizing. All of us have felt that, right? Who wants to walk around it like this so they don't have to, <laughs> you know? And everybody thinks it has a purpose. It has no purpose. <laughs> it doesn't, nurses don't like them. They're not invented for nurses to make it easier for them to get it to the back or something. And docs don't like them. When docs approach patients, they're much more interested in getting access to the front where they can hear the heart and you can hear the lungs from there. Um, and then they're more about covering people up than they are uncovering. We're constantly covering people up in the hospital to, to give them their humanness back. No, I've never found somebody that really enjoyed wearing one. <laughs> and yet they are ubiquitous in the healthcare system. They've been there for over 100 years and no one's questioned it or found an alternative. A t-shirt and boxer shorts would work a whole lot better, be a lot more comfortable, could be individualized, and yet we don't do that. Instead, we force people into this. So it's really interesting. You know, why does healthcare not innovate? Why doesn't it recognize the human needs and, and evolve with them? Um, and so this one's particularly good at, at demonstrating the, the the issues in the healthcare system. So the delivery system's really broken, highly invested in the status quo, um, and that is, part of that is doing more rather than doing better. The system gets paid for doing more stuff, not for having better outcomes. Your doc doesn't get paid for you being healthier in the other, at the other end, but your doc gets paid for having seen you. Um, you know, can you imagine any other, you know, um, any other industry working that way, you know? Um, you want to pay for a better product. You, you want your doc to be motivated for you to have better outcomes. They are, because that's their job to keep you healthy, but they still are gonna get distracted by how they're paid. And then we pay a lot more for treating the sickest rather than promoting health, and so therefore we emphasize that a lot more, and our systems do. And then we were resistant to technologies like email because they actually reduce how much docs get paid. So if you do that um, visit by email, there's no bill that can be generated, and so the doc, the clinic, the hospital don't get paid, and so they encourage this, this dysfunctional uh, system. Um, that's the, the, what happens in the healthcare system, but also outside in the community health system, we also need to, to be thinking about it differently. So, Docs and their tools, so drugs, devices, you know, all the things, shots, all the things that docs do, um, we focus a lot on. We've been focusing more on the care setting. You know, can we do this in the clinic, out, outpatient surgery, all that stuff. But if we really want to impact health, we need to be looking at the community. 
because more than 80% of health happens outside of the healthcare setting. If you look at a bunch of studies have looked at this, the real things that keep us healthy are the things that we do at home. You know, what we eat, how much we exercise, the, the conditions that we live in, um, how safe our homes are. That's where the real impact on health is, and yet we don't pay for that stuff. And not only do we not pay for it, we don't even know what happens in those settings. So this is a, a, a picture to remind me about um, the IBM Smart Cities thing. I don't know if you all heard about that. That was something that they're still doing. And basically, they're trying to collect a lot of data about how cities work. And it, but it was mostly focused on electricity and, and fire and police and that kind of thing. It wasn't in about health. But health, again, is so important. Shouldn't we be tracking what's going on with the health of our communities? Understand the differences in neighborhoods. Understand where we, you know, maybe putting a stoplight at a corner might make a huge difference in, in accident rates. We did the, this study in San Francisco a, a decade ago, looking at what the major causes of early mortality were. And it's amazing that this was a study, but it was a published study. Um, and what we found some surprises. So for, for women, HIV AIDS was the number one um, killer. We figured that would be true for men in San Francisco at this time, but not for women. So total shock. But for men, an even bigger shock, it wasn't really something that we even consider a health condition. It was, it was violence and, and assaults um, that made up the most important cause of, of, uh, of early death uh, for men. So not even on our list. That was a snapshot of what was going on in our communities at the time, a snapshot that we couldn't have unless we'd done this, this study. But what we really need is that data all the time on an ongoing basis. What's changing? You know, what's, what's getting worse? What's getting better? You know, what, how did this, does this neighborhood change from that neighborhood? We need that level of data. Um, others are collecting it for advertising. So the, your advertisers know a lot of this information about you, and yet we don't use this in any useful way in our health system, not health care system, health system, to think about how we can change neighborhoods and keep people healthier. The way we do research is broken as well. We put a big barrier and we say, okay, this stuff is research, it's over here, it's you know, NIH fund, you know, funded by the government and it takes a long time to do. And over here is care. We don't bring those two things together and say we should be learning as we care for people. Every patient we should be learning so that the next one benefits from the knowledge that we just got from the one before. That's a totally different way of thinking, unfortunately, from what we've had thus far. So if, if I, this is my picture of the healthcare system. It's just, it's just rock. And I don't, this is, a, this is some kind of weird geological formation that you're gonna have to explain to me later so because people ask me about that and I never can tell them. But it's, it's just this thing that just won't move, right? Like the, the, if you talk about whether it's the, the, the gown and whether it's email, it just doesn't change. Even when we all know it could be better, it just can't change. And that's what the opportunity of the med school is. Because we are different. We are starting from scratch. And in starting from scratch, we're not dependent as much. We still interface with all this other stuff. But we can say, we can ask questions like, well, what should a medical school do? What's its role in trying to make this stuff all work better? Can we design ourselves differently to help to encourage innovation to move the entire system along, to get it better matched with what we want it to be as people, not what providers want it to be or hospitals or clinics, but what we want as people from our health system. And that's really not, again, it's not about what happens in clinics and hospitals. That needs to improve, that needs to change, but it's about how the whole system works, adapts, changes, grows over time. And one thing that we're going to have to get to work in this is we're going to have to learn how to, to make, to create new ideas, to build on them, test them, study them, tear them down if they don't work, build them up if they do work. So it's the lean startup model. Build that in. We don't do that. Uh, we build things and then they stay that way for, for forever. 
Um, and for us, in part because you all brought us to life, right? So this community in voting to, to increase property tax to bring the med school brought the med school to life. We are, it's part of our DNA, part of why we exist is this connection with the community. We're your school. And what do you need us to do? What's the most important thing for us to do? It's not to be a top 10 med school, right? Who cares? I mean, you may care, it's kind of bring status or whatever to the community, but not really. What you want is this to be a healthy community. And so it's now our job to, to think about how we make or help to make Austin a model healthy city. And it's not our job to make it, it's our job, we have to define what our role is it's our collective job to make Austin a model healthy city. Now, what do I model means two things. One, it means, you know, great, but the other means a model to other cities, and that's really important as well. The things that we create here can also grow in, from here and in, in, uh, be uh, beacons, demonstrations that move to other cities as well. So now I'm gonna go through some specific things um, that we're working on. Some that we're working on, some that are just beginning to be um, uh, uh, discussed and worked on. I'm not gonna tell you everything that they told me not to tell you about some things that they wanna keep secret, um, but I'm gonna just talk about a few. Um, and one is just the system. And I, I'm not focusing on, oh, you know, new drugs or devices or all of that stuff. Th we are working on, on those things as well. But these are more things that we can all kind of understand. They're all kind of in our experience of what it's like to go to the doctor. This is part of our experience in going to the doctor, right? And isn't it just a horrible image, you know? Although that, that Chick-fil-A is making my mouth water. <laughs> the absolute worst thing to be eating. But the, you know, the crowded room and you know, people's feet out there and you know there's, yeah. You've, we've all been there. And we've read that Highlights magazine. <laughs> and the, the, uh, uh, the, a waiting room is a, it is, it, it's a accepting failure, right? It means the system says, you gotta wait. Who wants to wait? None of us wants to wait. So the system has decided, oh, waiting is just a necessary part of the healthcare experience. Um, we don't have waiting rooms at restaurants, right? Um, sometimes we have to wait if we don't, you know, didn't get a reservation. But if there's no waiting room, at least there's a comfortable place to hang out or whatever. This is, a, this is pretty unique. There's no waiting room in a, in a movie theater. So this is one of the things that, that we're working on. It's, it's more part of the whole experience of when you come to see a doctor. How can we make that better? Not just the waiting room, but the whole way you sign in and all that. So we've been talking to people. We, we use a thing called human-centered design. We go back to people and we start with their experiences and we really listen and try to understand what would you want? How would you want it to be better? And then based on that, those discussions, then we go back and redesign things. The guys that we have that lead this group are amazing. They came from the um, design firm IDEO um, IDEO is the firm that made the mouse, you know, the mouse for your computer, and also the laptop design. And they, the guy who leads this group headed their healthcare practice, which was the largest practice within IDEO. So he's like a world superstar in this stuff. And he's got now a big team with him that are, are they're just fabulous. So, so this is the, the way um, the experience usually is today, right? So you go, you check in, um, then somebody sees you and tells you what to do. You have some experiences or tests and all that stuff. There's weights between all of these things and it's kind of a messy, confusing um, experience. What, we've, what we're working on is, a, is something really different where you go and you check in and you can check in before you come or you can check in at a kiosk while you're there. You can check in electronically and then when you check in, you get a card and it's like a, a card to your, now this won't work perfectly when, you, when the <laughs> clinic first opens, but this is the design. You get a card just like you would if you're staying at a hotel and on that tells you what room you're in. You go, you open your door, that's your room. Everybody else comes to you. So you're in your room, that's your space and the healthcare comes to you. It's coordinated around you. 
we, we need to know where you are. We need to know when you arrive. We need to know what room you're in. So you've got some responsibilities there as well. But much better experience for people, much less confusing. And it's centered around you, not around the provider, not around the doctor. And so that's a better experience for the person. It's reminding us how important the person is in defining how healthcare is delivered. All right, so this is a part two. So this is a, um, this was the doctor of the future now, what, 50 years ago, right? Um, and the, we've been thinking a lot about what the doctor of the future needs to look like. I'm not gonna talk about our med school curriculum. Some of our students are here. So can you guys raise your hands, actually? I don't know if anybody can see anybody. I'll make you do it later, but there's some, some of the students are here, so you can talk to them about what our curriculum is like. Um, and for us, it is different, because we think doctors should be trained differently than, than, the doc, than I was trained, you know, than the, the old Tommy doctors. Um, but also, doctors are gonna change and change the way they work. And for this doctor, he's, He's got some things sort of stuck in his memory, but he's also, um, he's also relying heavily on a computer, right? So he works with that computer, um, and the computer helps him to, um, uh, to, to solve the problems and all of that um, that he sees in front of him. Then now we're getting a few years later, again, a TV doctor, um, again from Star Trek. Um, this is not a real person. This is a hologram, right, in this, in this series. So now this is science fiction telling us kind of what's coming. It's all computer and then an image created from the computer. So now there's no even human doctor anymore, right? So this, this transition is one that we suspect will happen, not in my lifetime, <laughs> thankfully, or else I wouldn't have a job. Um, but we think that over time, we're, that more and more doctors are gonna rely on, on computers and artificial intelligence for more and more of what they do. Um, already we've seen that transition and we're accepting that that transition is an important one. So actually even today, the number one resource for, for physicians it is once again the cell phone and it's Google on a cell phone. That's the number one reference for physicians today. So already we're seeing this, this transition, um, and this transition is going to become more and more rapid. So how are we embracing that? Well, we need to make doctors more aware of all the things that are going on with our lives, right? So that it's easier for them to comprehend those things and then make decisions about, that are more informed. So they're not gonna forget about allergies anymore. You know, they're gonna know you got those allergies and that's right in front of them always at the most important times. This was the Promise Electronic Health Records, but it failed and they're still failing. And so we're building a layer above the electronic health record where it's almost like the app store and Apple where people can come and build those tools on that layer. And this will also include interfaces for people to use not for docs, so they can understand more about their health and take more control. In his hand was this tricorder thing. So in the tricorder was, did everything, right? They just waved it over and then the computer told you what was wrong and what to give them. Um, we're a ways off from this, but it's interesting that we are getting closer to the tricorder notion uh, in healthcare. So this is an example of a handheld ultrasound and it used to be that ultrasound were these gigantic machines. I mean, you're still in the hospital, you see most of them are these huge machines that they wheel into the room and, um, and then the technician spins, you know, 45 minutes with a group on the person. Um, now, this is basically replacing the stethoscope. So this, you can just stick it in your pocket, you pull it out, you can, instead of just listening to the heart, you can actually see the heart. If you're worried about fluid around the lung, you can see that. If you're worried whether the liver's too big, you can still percuss, you know, tap on the, the belly, but that's much less accurate than actually seeing where that liver edge is. And so, and this is cheap. So that old machine was $15,000. These are now about $600. So more and more, it's like an expensive stethoscope. So you'll be starting to see these. And as we change the economics of healthcare where we don't care about billing people for this stuff, we just want the best tools in people's hands so that they can do a good job, 
you'll see that this will be used more and more and more. So our students are going to be learning how to use these things. And it's, it'll, it will make a big difference in terms of the, the, how many complications and problems they have and the procedures that they do. And then, so that's a tool that a doctor would use. This is a really interesting tool that, that's meant for people at home. So how many of you have had problems yourself or children with ear infection problems? And I certainly am one of those people. So I don't know. Any of you guys have ear infections? Um, and it, this is another one of these painful things, right? You go in, you have to see the doctor. And you, you know, you've got to find somebody you'll, you'll see. You go in there, everybody is screaming and, oh. You know, uh, and, um, you know, it's just whether you get antibiotics, yes or no, right? That's the real, that's what you're trying to address. Well, this thing, it's connected to your phone. And it's, it's an inexpensive device, connects to your phone, and anybody can learn how to use it. It's actually really easy to use. The hard part about this for the doctor isn't seeing in there. That's really easy. Anybody can do that. You just pull the ear back and you push the thing in. It's, it's analyzing. It's understanding what the image is showing you. But the images on these, this is a cell phone, so it's beamed directly to the doctor's office. The doctor looks at the image and says, antibiotics, yes, antibiotics, no. And then can immediately call that in and have you go get it. So this is, this is really inexpensive um, and uh, now can be widely available. And it demonstrates how we're starting to, to hand the technologies over to people, teaching them how to do it, and then giving more and more of the care to people. So you can imagine how this will continue to change over time. More and more, we're, as people, going to be responsible for our own health care. And this will be completely liberating, right? Still need docs for the critical piece, but that critical piece can become more and more narrow over time. Maybe even give docs more time to have meaningful discussions with patients. So some of these are ideas that are in our school. Some of these are ideas from, from other places. But really for us, it's not about these high tech things. It's really about how do we liberate a whole large group of entrepreneurs, you all included, to come up with these solutions and to have a way in which if they're successful, if they improve health and they improve outcome and, or they lower cost and keep health the same, that there's a way for them to be carried further in the healthcare system. So how do we liberate entrepreneurs? By entrepreneurs, I don't mean, too, the traditional ones that want to do it to make money. Social entrepreneurs count, too. People are doing it for, for good as their primary goal. Um, OK, so this is one. So now we're doing a series of, of, um, of uh, um, projects to understand how we engage a larger group to start to come up with solutions to healthcare problems. All right, so it's in the, it's this one, right? All right, and this is going to make some noise. So this is one example. Those guys from IDEO I mentioned put this one together, South by Southwest, to just see, can we get good ideas from folks um, in the community? It's just a couple minutes, so.
so we ended up with um, hundreds of ideas that came out of this program. And then we had to, of course, judge them, and we had a great panel to, to judge them. Um, you, you saw some of the ideas there. Um, the one that, that won the prize, um, and the, the prize wasn't huge. It was, um, I mean, it was a, it was a nice prize, $1,000, but it was more the acclaim than anything else. Um, that person um, came up with an idea called the health box. Um, and it's a great idea um, and one that we're still working on and, I, and we're hoping to, uh, uh, to put into play. But it's the notion that, and I could tell you about it because it's not like, a, you know, it's not patentable or anything. So, but it's when people leave um, the hospital or when people leave with a new diagnosis like diabetes or high blood pressure or whatever, there's a, they need to, to start their life anew, right? They need to, to learn how to, what to eat and, and um, uh, what they should and should not do. And so the health box notion is we're going to put all that in a box, including the food, and we're going to deliver it to patients. And particularly for diet, it's really important to, to initiate that. So think sort of blue apron around health issues with the other health products also in it. So it's a great idea. Um, and so now we're, we're working on, uh, on testing it in, in real people. Um, and then we think we, we uh, may have a partner for um, distributing it even more broadly. Um, so that was, that was one. Then we're doing an, another project um, on campus. So the, the take on it was, well, you know, how can we, we're talking about changing and improving the health of the community. And well, what the heck's going on right here at UT? So shouldn't we be models here at UT? Can we get our own students excited and innovating? And so there's another program that, we're, that we've already launched that's still underway. It goes for another, I guess we have all the applications now and we're um, uh, evaluating them. Um, 450 people contributed to it. Um, 22 ideas. They created beautiful videos. There's some great ideas. And we'll pick one or two of those a year to do. Um, but now we're doing another even broader project. And this is the, these are all tests. We're going to figure out exactly how to scale these up as we go. But if you're in AISD, then you should have gotten, if you're a student, a little sheet that describes this, this effort. Some are shaking their heads, you guys didn't get it, huh? All right, well, they're, they're at the back of the room, and they're, I think, like four more days to get your, your ideas in. Um, but the notion is, can you all give us an idea? Doesn't have to be for everybody in Austin. Might be a group that, that um, would benefit. Some idea that could improve health in an important segment in our community, and that's any segment in our community. Um, and then, We'll pick the best ideas and we'll create teams around them because, you know, you'll have some, you'll have ideas, but you'll need a team, right? Having a design group work with you is awesome. But also having people who really under help, understand health or nutrition or whatever it is work on your team to optimize that idea, that's also really important. And there's some money that comes with it too. Um, so this is, this is the program, this Rethink Community program. And the, this is how you can put in um, your ideas. So you got to the fifth. Sorry, but that's enough. You know, that's actually enough. They're really short and um, should be fun. Um, in, you can pick them up at the libraries too, but you can see the, the web addresses there on the, on the bottom. Um, and I'm, uh, I'll put it back up on the screen after I'm done. But again, there's some sheets too at the back that describe it. So this is partly how, it, it, you know, we are doing this because we know we'll get great ideas this way. The great ideas aren't going to just come from an ivory tower. They're going to come from the people who are affected, right? And we also need those people to rise up and lead to find these solutions. We know you can't do it by yourselves. So we're going to help as much as we can to enable these changes to happen. The other reason we do it is so that we recognize that we're all empowered to have an impact on the health of our communities. Even if our ideas don't get picked, we're thinking differently about gosh, you know, maybe that wasn't a great idea or wasn't great enough. Um, maybe this would work better. And 
more and more we're trying to find ways to, to generate a greater, larger and larger platform to, to collect these ideas, to identify the best ones, to find funding and support to, to move them forward. So this is, this is my, my last slide. Um, so this is a special moment in time. Um, the healthcare system is in terrible disarray um, and the meteor is coming. <laughs> and after the meteor, the mammals arose, right? Uh, and so we have this opportunity in this special moment in time, in this special place to, to do things differently, to create that system that becomes a model, to create a whole series of ideas that then spread from Austin around the world. And that's only going to happen with you all stepping up and coming up in, with those solutions. So thank you very much. Mike. Thank you, Clay. Clay will be happy to answer questions. We'll have uh, two mic stands, one on this aisle and one on that aisle. So please come on up to the front and line up. No questions. That never happens. <laughs> okay, great. Uh, the one thing that I didn't hear in that question. Maybe one thing I didn't hear. Is that okay, everyone? maybe not on. There it goes. Yes. The, uh, the one thing that I didn't hear talked about it that in, all, in that discussion at all was insurance and. To, to affect any of this kind of real change, don't you have to get the insurance company buying into some of these things? Great question. So, so insurance, how does it fit into this? Um, so insurance is, um, has been slow as part of that rock, uh, maybe at the center of that rock. Um, and yes, unless we pay for things differently, we're not going to find these solutions. But it ends up, insurance companies aren't necessarily motivated for us to be healthier. Sad but true. Because we turn over from one insurance company to the next, it's not in their interest to invest in us. Um, so prevention, that's partly why prevention's not paid for. Also, most insurance is just, they get paid a little extra for every dollar that the panel of people they cover spends in healthcare. So they're not motivated to reduce cost or to keep us healthier because if the costs are greater, actually their piece is greater. So the key though is that there are of the people who pay for the insurance, the people who buy the insurance, care deeply about our health and the cost of that health care. So that's, it can be a, a business. So if you get your insurance through a business, most of those businesses, including UT System, are um, paying for all the health care and want you healthy and working. And so our, their interests are very much aligned with ours. So what we do is we go directly to those entities. We're fortunate in Travis County that we have one that acts that way already too, Central Health. So the County Health District in Travis County has fixed dollars, wants to use those as effectively as it can and wants to spend them wisely. And so they love these new approaches, which is what the, the med school is trying to accelerate. Let's see, I'm gonna go here and then over there. Yeah, go ahead. Hi, um, I think you should also look at what uh, the health care or the, the medicine that we as practice affects the uh, individuals. I had a situation where I lost all my medical coverage and lost my prescriptions and my health got better because I was apparently treating conditions that the meds were causing. Yeah, excellent question. So, you know, there, it's definitely true that medica medications can cause side effects, and if you're on the wrong medications, you, you know, and people add new medications. Um, and that's all about sort of good doctoring. Um, that means taking more time with patients, understanding when you have it wrong, looking at patterns. So we're really into, into tracking how healthy patients are. So part of the systems that we're building um, relate to getting feedback from patients on how healthy they are, how they're responding to their meds so we can interact with them more rapidly. So completely agree. Um, we've tended to use too much drugs too. There are all kinds of other approaches. We have this uh, in really impressive, powerful um, inner ability to heal ourselves that we have totally downplayed in, in the, the healthcare system. 
And there's a lot of evidence that shows how powerful that effect is. So that's another thing that we're really interested in bringing back. Yeah. Um, I have two things. So one of them is, so you know how you said the U.S. is the, one of the most expensive and Switzerland is the next? Yeah. Is it like the most expensive? Uh, I don't doubt that because I've been to Switzerland and like you have to pay for shopping carts there. Yeah. And it's kind of sad. But where is Switzerland on like, you know, the health scale? Where is it? Oh, that's a great question. So Switzerland is higher than we are um, on the health scale in terms of health outcomes, but they're not at the top. Yeah, it's interesting. Um, the, there are a couple of different countries kind of uh, over, you know, go back and forth at the top, but um, England is actually one of the healthiest countries in the world. Um, it, the cost of health care in England is about a third of what it is here. So pretty interesting, actually, that they, they're able to have one of the best health care systems for, for that lower cost. Also, my dad, um, he, he does this thing where he works on, like, buildings and air conditioners. Uh -huh. And if, if the air conditioners are bad, your health care goes down, your health goes down. Yeah. And then if, like, how can he work on, like, making good air conditioners? Making good air conditioners. That's great. Well, thank your dad for his good work. Uh, we couldn't live in Austin without your dad and people <laughs> like him. Um, but the, um, it's a good, it's actually an interesting point relate, not just about air conditioners, but the quality of the air. So indoor air pollution really is important. It's like, it's so strange. I, I always just thought it was annoying to, you know, to have those smells hang, hanging out. No, it's actually unhealthy. Um, and more and more data has shown that. So indoor air pollution is actually quite important. The other thing that we've underestimated too is how much control we have over asthma. The home environment is so critical to asthma. It's not just, you know, oh, the child, they're genetically uh, inclined to asthma. So in some of that relates to um, air conditioning systems. It, even more, it relates to, um, to carpeting and animals and, and other things. Yep. Um, so I understand how um, the Dell Medical School wants to change healthcare and a broken healthcare system by educating um, medical professionals differently. Um, but I thought also you were saying that part of the problem is that the incentives are wrong. It's more quantity of care rather than quality. How would Dell Medical School address that's that? Great question. So, so we're not just training. So that's the one thing I probably should have said right up front is that med schools aren't just places where future doctors learn. They're also places that provide health care. Um, and so it's a weird thing, right? The business school doesn't also do consulting, you know? The law school's not also having clients, but we have patients and we care for, for people in the community. We work too closely with the community docs because they're great in this, in this community and we wanna, everybody wants to elevate their game, so we're, we're working with them. But we have our own doctors and systems. So we have our own clinics and doctors and, and, and all of that. So the, um, the way we need to do it then is to get paid differently. So we're trying not to get paid in the usual fee-for-service system where you know, we do more and we get paid more. We're trying to go, again, directly to the payers, to the self-insured businesses or the governmental entities and say, pay us because we have better outcomes. And if, we, if our outcomes aren't so good, then don't pay us as much. If our outcomes are even better, then pay us more. But we want to be paid based on our people being healthier, having the best outcome. So a good example would be joints. A lot of problem with joint pain. Um, and a lot of sort of variable care. Um, excellent orthopedic care in Austin, but maybe a little bit too much surgery. And so we can, we can look and track those outcomes and say, gosh, if we do a better job, pay us more. If we don't do a better job, then don't come to us and we'll show you the outcomes. And so that's kind of the way we, we, we get that to work. But thank you. Yeah. Uh, Clay, excuse me. I want to mention to everyone we have these uh, photographs of Clay, hot science photographs, and they're signed in gold. And <laughs> we'll be giving these out at the end to those who've asked the best questions. So I hope no somebody pressure. else is tracking all that. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, go ahead. Um, okay, so in many ways I'm playing the devil's advocate, but I'm curious here. Um, you said before uh, that a lot of doctors don't want to do email-based systems and sort of go to that technology because they're paid less, but I think that it's an argument that doctors and practitioners, NPs, PAs, 
I mean, uh, sacrifice so much of our time getting schooled and money getting schooled yeah. that in many ways we deal in knowledge. We are paid because we have um, sometimes <laughs> the answer, you know, the knowledgeable yeah. information that is not found on WebMD and Google. Um, and so I guess my question is just sort of if, like, what do you have to say to doctors that support that view? How are you without some widespread drastic change in the insurance you know system or the way that doctors are paid how are you planning to address that we're going to but actually we are interested in the, the drastic changes in the way that doctors are paid so I agree with you completely why do we why do we pay doctors so much doctors are paid a lot right and but even worse than that we in society invest so much in doctors training so training doctors is really expensive too why do we do that? And then why do we encourage some of our really smart people to go into it as opposed to becoming engineers or geologists or, you know, it's because we understand that that, that position has value. I completely agree. The value, it's, there's two parts to the value, I think, it, more than that even, but one is the, the analytics. It's not the knowledge that we hold necessarily. It's how we apply that knowledge, how, how we synthesize a lot of complicated information to, to make sense of a problem. The second piece is the connection that we have, right? How we communicate, how we, how we, how we work directly with a person, not with a machine or a, and those are the two things I think that are really uniquely um, clinician oriented. I shouldn't even say doctor. Those are, those are, are all clinicians. What we need to do is have a system that embraces those things and gets rid of the junk and there's a bunch of junk that, that is normally thrown at the clinicians today. So a visit for high blood pressure where you just, you know, pump up the cuff, look at a number and send them home with the same, you know, that's something that could get done at home. And then having a meaningful long encounter to discuss why high blood pressure is so important, then that becomes um, uh, something that, that you could focus on and, and appropriately allow a clinician to spend more time doing. We're all aware of the increase in cost, and I see there's a lot of paperwork and now electronic communication and storage of records. I noticed one of the um, people that had, a su uh, had an idea to submit in that competition suggested pa passwordless portals. So my question is now, as a local um, patient, uh, my husband and I have several patient portals now, yeah. and every doctor's office is spending a lot of money. They have their own IT department, their own track, their own yeah. systems. Oh. Duplication and um, yeah. how are we going to bring that together and presumably save money, you know, doing a better job of totally agree. and storing records. Yeah, that's a great question. Where the, the patient portal stuff, and the patient portals are pretty awful, right? They're yeah. just, yeah, they, it's, uh, I mean, email is so much easier. I wish we could just do email, but we have these patient portals instead. Um, so we have to, f the platform has to change. So the currently um, every patient portal is specific to the electronic health record underneath it and every t electronic health record is different. And so that was that thing that I, I told you that we're, we're looking at building. We can't afford to build this ourselves so we're trying to find partners to do it which is this, this sort of um, a, a, a place on the way for the data from regardless of what electronic health record it is to go into this data environment and then the tools to be built on top. So one patient portal regardless of which electronic health record is underneath. To coordinate multiple. Exactly. And that allows us to do it. The reason, I mean, that's what we need universally. It, and so it, we're not the only ones working on that, but, we, um, but, but we're already investing in it. And I, I think that it is going to take us a while. I want to be realistic. But that one is a, it absolutely needs to happen. Yeah. Um, well, I got two questions. Um, one of them is, like, I, knew, I know that um, medical insurance, it costs a lot, but is there a way to, like, like lower down the, um, how much it costs? Because lots of people, everybody need medical insurance. Yeah, well, there are a number of different attempts to try to lower it, um, and there are ways, um, but, you know, I'm, I'm happy that that's not my job to try to do the governmental work to make that happen. 
um, you know, governments have decide kind of where, what insurance costs by the way they subsidize or the way healthy people subsidize people who are less healthy for their insurance. Um, and that has been a really complicated issue. Um, from our perspective, what we do control is waste. And waste in our system is not acceptable. There's a lot of waste in our system. And so we're really focused on getting that out of the system. Um, okay, well, my other question is, remember when you said, like, some people write their ideas, like, to help us, like, and then y'all choose the best, um, best idea? Yeah. What about the other good ideas? Oh, we're, we're hopeful that, that if there are multiple good ideas, we'll do as many as we, we'll help as many people as we can. And we hope that others where we can't help them, that they'll find a way to get those ideas done. Yeah, good question. Yeah, go ahead. Okay, so a couple things. One is I've been thinking about how the high costing thing, high costs of the US are not the best in patient outcomes. Is it possible that some of the higher, the lower costing ones have better patient outcomes because they don't, it's more accessible and what not? Yeah, so that's a great question. So that's definitely a part of why their outcomes are better. So if you look at our outcomes, it ends up there's, there are big differences between people who have insurance and people who don't. There are big differences between people who are wealthy and people who are poor. In a country like Cuba, there are no differences between, there are no rich and poor in Cuba. They're all about the same. And so they don't have those disparities that we have, those inequities in health outcomes. Good, so that's a great question. Yeah, and also, if there is a, if there, since some medications are covered by insurance, while others, like the anxiety med I'm taking right now, aren't exact, require, aren't exactly covered, so basically, Getting anxiety medication, which isn't even working yet, if ever will, it costs like 101 bucks a month. Yeah. I am pretty sure that's too so much. So why would they do that? Yeah, so it's that complicates another great question. So drug, drugs are, are too expensive. They're getting more expensive. There are big differences in different types of drugs in terms of their cost. It's a, it has to do with the way the U.S. system is set up. We, um, we do a wonderful thing for the rest of the world. We pay for drug development for the rest of the world. So on our backs, the costs are higher. It costs too much to develop new drugs. Our, our prices are substantially higher than other countries. So we, we are the ones really who are investing in, in the next generation of drugs. So that's part of it. It also has to do with the way we distribute profits and things, which you know we're not going to solve. But thank you for your questions. Yeah. This gentleman has the next question, but I want to say everyone in line will get to answer your questions. But we won't have time after that, so please, no one else, join the line. And we'll try to get to all your questions. And please, please, I know a lot of you, all the questions are great. Some of you had multiple ones. That's really good. Ask your best one, so everyone yeah. will have we'll a chance to ask your question. One each from that one. Yeah. Hi, so I've really enjoyed your speech. Uh, this semester I've taken a course called Global Inequalities in Health where we wrote a book by T.R. Reid and explored uh, healthcare systems around the world. Uh, are you guys also, you know, taking a look at other systems? Great to question. Like the Carte Vital, I know you mentioned something similar to that that you guys are working on that yeah. France has. Yeah, so it's a great question. So, so it's a, it, global health at many medical schools is about oh, you know, we're so smart here, we're gonna help you solve your health problems. Our version of it is, the, is exactly what you, des you described. Other countries actually have solved some of these problems because their health systems are different. It's not the, that we could import any of the solutions that are in other countries to the US because of our unique nature and our character, but we can learn from them. So yeah, that's part of the global health system that we're, we're setting up. And yeah, it's a, it's a neat way to learn fast. So is it okay if I have two really, really quick questions? If they're quick, and I'll answer them quick. Okay, so the first one is, um, do you know what percent of people um, have gotten what they
like what the whatever they were taking said they were going to get out of it. Um, so you mean like their drug? Did their drug do what it was supposed to do? Yeah. No, no one knows the, that answer. <laughs> it's an interesting question, um, and I don't even know how to answer it. Um, they, you know, a number of people have side effects from whatever medicine that they're getting, and then it depends completely on the condition whether meds will always work, mostly work, only sometimes work. Okay. Then my last question was: Do you know of any? studies that have shown anything about music affecting your health? Yeah, there are a whole bunch of studies that look at music and health. Music has a, has a real um, impact in health in a lot of different settings, whether it's inpatient setting or outpatient, and for psychiatric illness, so for, you know, for um, emotional uh, problems as well as um, for, for other ailments. So yeah, music's great. And that, you know, this one of the things we've been looking at is how we bring more music into, into the hospital setting. So great, great questions. Yeah. Um, I have one question and just like a small comment. So the comment is that um, originally you were talking about how uh, you were thinking how doctors should be um, paid depending on what their outcome is on the patient. Well, one thing I found interesting was that in Hammurabi's rule of code, I in his code, it said that if a doctor operates on a, I'm sure you didn't want to go in this deep, but if a doctor operates on a patient and the patient dies, his hand will be cut off. Yeah, we're probably not going to go that far. Yeah, hopefully not. Um. But, um, and my question is, you have all of these great ideas about what to do and how to make healthcare better for all, for um, everyone. How will you plan to Im how do you plan to implant these? Yeah, so um, we can't do everything all at once, right? We're a brand new school. We've only been around for a couple of years. I mean, we've only just started students. Most of our leaders have been here for less than six months. So we have to focus on a few things and show how we can do them well. So we're choosing things that are important health issues for this community, and then we're we're going deep and working hard on them, and then we'll expand from there. And so, I mean, I could tell you more about them, but the, um, you know, joints ends up being a really big problem in this community, so joint pain, back pain, so we're looking at that. Um, diabetes, high blood pressure, um, those sorts of, that constellation of things that makes chronic disease, we call it, um, is another big one, so we're definitely focusing there. And the whole women's health is another big issue. We're focusing there. So those are three examples of areas. Okay. Good. Thank you. Sure. Um, as you mentioned before, a number of people taking drugs have side effects. Have you looked into nat um, natural remedies? Natural remedies, yeah, as opposed to drugs. So it's a great question. So there, there are um, uh, some studies that show that, they, that natural remedies for certain things work really well, and some have shown that they don't actually work. And it's really important to, to have some evidence of what works and what doesn't before we recommend it. So, um, and even some natural remedies are bad for you. So there's a whole range. Um, so we'll do more studies in those areas for sure. Um, right now we rely mostly on what other, what studies have been done in other places. We're really interested though in, in um, some of these natural remedies, but also some other approaches like um, like acupuncture, like um, meditation, um, like yoga. There's a few others where there actually is a fair amount of evidence that they can improve outcomes for certain conditions. And so we're going to study those more deeply as well. Not for everybody, but for certain people, they can have um, a real strong effect. We act actually have this expert in those things that we've hired, this amazing guy who's uh, going to study those more and more. Thank you. You could say the same thing about the drugs as you did about the natural remedies. Oh. Sometimes they work, sometimes they don't. Yeah. So the <laughs> so on drugs, though, the at least we have the FDA, the right? Studies. Yeah. So at least the FDA does a randomized trial to test those drugs. It ends up sometimes the FDA is wrong, the trial's wrong, and when we test it in big populations, we're wrong. The other problem with those studies, of course, they're done on a on a group of patients that's fairly s healthy and more similar than who we ultimately treat, right? And there's subgroups that may not do well on them at all. So, yep. My question is, uh, has to do with your students. Traditionally, med students have to go through 
nightmares to sometimes they, they have to wor learn way more than they can possibly learn in a short period of time. Yeah. And then their residencies are nightmare again. Uh, what are you doing for your students? Yeah. <laughs> we we want to make sure our students are not experiencing nightmares. Um, so um, uh, we have a our program is much more um, community and sort of cohesive um, than than my med school was. So my med school was cutthroat, um, highly competitive, all lecture based and tests. Um, for our students, it's group problem solving. They work together to solve problems because that's what that's what you do in real life, right? I mean, that's what we want our docs to do is to be working with an expert who has knowledge that they don't to solve the problem, who that may be a pharmacist or a nurse or, or you know, not a physician at all. We have to start teaching that early. But that creates a, a stronger community feel. So I'm in the med student's building too. So we don't have classroom building and then office building. We're all in the same space. In fact, there's this big staircase that connects us all together. And so when I walk um, up the stairs in the morning, I see that I pass through the students, you know, all their different levels. They have a, all these lounges and the kitchen. I mean, they, we take good care of them. But it's a very good point because th actually for medical students, it is so hard um, that rates of depression are sky high and rates of suicide are high too. And I mean, that we just cannot accept. So we're, we're on, on that all the time to, to make sure they're happy and doing well. Genetic testing has been open to the public for about 10 years. Yeah. And I'm curious, do you have an estimate and when that information will be interwoven Into for the us as patients when we see the doctor since it's so personal and so specific yeah. to, to the person? Is that microphone working? Did you hear that? Okay, so um, so it's a great question, um, and no one really knows the answer to that question. There's um, how many of you have had your genome analyzed? A little. A little. So just a couple people to know what's in your genetic background. Um, so um, obviously we have to. If we if that information is available, it needs to be part of the of the data that's used to make decisions on people. It needs to be part of it. Our data systems don't currently allow for that. Um, and it's so much data, right? And it changes over time. We think that this, this polymorphism is associated with this disease and we discover that in fact it wasn't, right? Or we never knew that this had this association and now we find that it does. And so that's evolving all the time. So this is part of this data problem that we have. That's partly why we were creating this layer above electronic health records. Ultimately, each of us should be responsible for our electronic health record, right? We should be the stewards of our record, who gets in, who doesn't get in, and all the data about us should be collected in that common point. But we're, we're a ways from, from realizing that. Um, but it will happen, actually. So that, I, I suspect, will happen in the next 10 to 20 years. Yeah, but it's a ton of data. Um, I'll tell you that the, some of the computer companies are, are counting on it because they're, <laughs> they're, they're looking at making investments in data storage, for example, to accommodate all of this. But, yep, thank you for your question. Yeah, go ahead. Um, I have two things to say. Number one, I agree with you that kids should have longer recess. <laughs> 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 and, um, I, at my school, I live, I go to a school in Pflugerville, and um, I only have 15 minutes outside, and I feel like I should have longer. Yeah. Yeah, recess is pretty important um, for, for your physical health, and even on weekends, too. You know, kids with too much screen time, that's not good for you either. So getting outside every day, at an hour, not 15 minutes, is really what you need to keep you healthy. So I agree with you. Um, and the, the schools are, you know, they need to be thinking about this too. And um, also, I was wondering why you didn't do the, uh, whoever did that uh, study, they didn't do it in Texas in, instead of California. Which study? Um, oh, the one in San Francisco. 
oh, so that's what we're trying to get done now. The reason that was done in San Francisco is because that's where I lived when, when that was done. Oh. Yeah. Yeah, I didn't, I've, I've only been here for, for uh, two and a half years. So I'm new to Austin. Oh. Yeah, but thank you for your questions. That's good. Yeah, go ahead. Um, what do you plan on to do to the schools by with all this technology and stuff? What do we plan to do with the schools with all this technology? So that's a great question. So we really want to work within the schools to, in part, teach people about um, how they control their health. So good decisions, bad decisions, and how you can stay healthy. But we also want to get more people in the schools excited about going in, not just being a doctor, but doing anything in healthcare. There's a whole array of, of cool things that you can do in healthcare. And we need more people in those specialties. Um, and so we want to go to the schools to try to get folks excited about that. We also think that you guys are going to have a lot of the good ideas about how to he keep the whole community healthy. So we're going to come to you for those ideas. So a lot of different ways. Did you get one of the flyers? Did you get, are you AISD? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so you should have gotten one of those. So you, did you put in a proposal? All right, well, get it done now. See, I left it up there so you can. <laughs> All right, go, go ahead. Um, what do you test your drugs on? Um, so, so we do do clinical trials, just so everybody knows, at the med school. We're already doing them. And in fact, that's my, my background. I, I'm, a, I'm a neurologist. I study stroke. And I do all kinds of epidemiology and stroke, stroke prevention, and then trials and prevention. So we are doing those, those studies. So we're doing a couple really gigantic studies right now, one that has 5,800 people in it and another one that's, that's going to have 13,000 people in it from all over the world. So we are doing those kinds of studies on people. Now, other people, we're not doing this, but at least not now, and we may over time, do, do some studies in animals to look at, at drugs like cancer drugs, um, to look at stroke drugs, um, to see, because it's safer to do that in an animal than it is in a person. But we don't, we're not really doing that right now in the med school. Um, I have one more question. Why okay. is the, sometimes it's kind of hard to get into med medical schools? Yeah, it is. <laughs> it's hard. <laughs> yeah, oh, that was a question? <laughs> it's going to stay being hard. It's a good question. So, yes, it's hard. So we had, we have only 50 spots in our school. Just, I mean, our school is really, really hard to get into, just so you know. We have 50 spots in our school, and we had this year 4,850 people apply for those 50 spots. So it's like it makes me, it breaks my heart, because when you see all these people who are applying, they're fabulous. You know, we'd love to take all 4,850 of them, but we can only take 1%, 1 percent, 1 out of 100. Ugh. But um, Did you want to highlight some of these fabulous people in the school who are here? Yeah, so where are the, where, where are the students? I can't see because of this, the light. If you're a Dell Medical student, please stand oh, up. Oh, there, there. Yeah. All right, good. So thanks, you guys, for coming. So actually, maybe they should come up. There you are. Yeah, come on up, you guys. So they can answer your questions, too, at the end. Because after this question, come on up. Make yourselves available so you guys can answer. Thanks for coming, too. OK. By the way. We have the last they work question. hard, but they're, yeah. uh, um, That's great. they're here. Yeah. We'll have the last question, then we'll ask you to come down and answer others. I understand that you said what was wrong with the um, system, but how do you envision fixing it? Like, do you, un do you envision a, a global portal or specialized programs for each doctor's office? Or yeah, it's going to be hard, right? So there's so many things that need fixing. We talked about a bunch of them with the questions. So for us, we know we can't solve all these problems. What we're really interested in doing is can we make it easier for everybody to come forward and solve these problems? So one of the key pieces is to get people paid for finding solutions that improve health outcomes and then having a way to introduce those into the health care system more readily. So that's kind of what we're working on. And that's partly why we're getting all these ideas from you all to get you excited about it and to show how to do that. You know, let's say you guys were working on um, you know, can, toys, right? 
do we need, we don't need a, a new system to have people design and build and test and, and share. That works, or apps on your iPhone. We don't need a new system, that works. And healthcare, it doesn't work. So that's partly what we're trying to do is figure out how to make that system work. How can I get involved in, uh, as a high school student in things at the Cell Medical School? Or yeah, so that's a great question. So, you know, this is one way you can do it. It's over the weekend, but you can get that done. And then the, um, we do have summer camps. Um, unfortunately, we are not as large as we would like. We get a lot more applicants than we can take for those camps. Um, but we're, we will continue to grow those camps. And then over time, there'll be more and more ways. Right now, there aren't enough of us to, to do all the things that we would love to do. But over time, there'll be more of us to, to, to work with all of you all. Sure. Thanks. So we'll have uh, Clay and his, uh, and his band of merry medical students. hang out students. up here if there are other hang questions. Out up here. And if you have questions, come on up. If you've asked a question and uh, want to be in the running for one of the signed photographs in gold. Uh, <laughs>